Hello, I am Edmond Jamna, and on behalf of DW Consult, I want to introduce to you Tutorials on the Go. Our zeal here is to help transition people with zero, struggling, and shaky base in accounting to an expert position and to a place of confidence. It is also a platform to stay abreast in all matters of accounting. Tutorials on the Go is also designed to assist in the smooth studying of the ACCA and ICA professional qualifications as well as any tertiary accounting discipline. All that is required of you is to subscribe to our channel on YouTube at DW Consult and click on the notification bell to be part of it. Also, like and share the videos by way of inviting others to come aboard. Tutorials on the go, bringing accounting to heart. Now, today's episode's lecture, Intangible Assets, IAS 38. Uh, over the past few weeks, we have discussed non-current assets where we focused on those ones with physical substance. So we first looked at property plant and equipment, which was IES 16. We moved on to talk about investment property, which is IES 40. We spoke about borrowing costs, which is IES 23. Then we finally spoke about government grants, which is IES 20. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the assets which does not have physical substance which IES 38 tackles. So let's move straight into action. Let's first talk about the definition of an intangible asset. Now, an intangible asset is an identifiable, non-monetary asset with no physical substance. So it has three attributes. Identifiability. It means the item must be separable. When an item is separable, it means that it can be sold, transferred, or licensed on its own, or it arises from contractual or other legal rights. The second one is controlled meaning the entity has the power to benefit from the asset. The last one is that the asset must have the potential of yielding future economic benefit to the entity. Examples of intangible assets will include softwares, licenses, franchise, trademark, copyright, patent, films, to mention a few. So goodwill acquired in a business combination is accounted for in accordance with IFRS 3 which is business combination, and is therefore outside the scope of IAS 38. Okay. Now, any expenditure on an intangible item is recognized as an asset, if and only if it is probable that there will be future economic benefits from the asset. And secondly, the cost of the asset can be reliably measured. Now, intangible assets are measured initially at cost. So after initial recognition, an entity usually measures an intangible asset at cost less accumulated amortization or impairment. Now, if you hear amortization, it is similar to depreciation with tangible non-current assets. So, tangible non-current assets will be depreciated. Intangible non-current assets will be amortized. So, in rare cases, an entity may choose to measure the asset at fair value. Now, where the fair value can be determined by reference to an active market. Okay, an intangible asset with a finite useful life is amortized and is subject to impairment. Now, an intangible asset with an infinite useful life is not amortized, but is rather tested annually for impairment. Okay. So lastly, when an intangible asset is disposed of, the gain or loss on disposal is charged to the profit or loss account. So there are two main types of intangible assets. There are other ways with which intangible assets will come into the business. For example, it can come through it being purchased separately, business combination, government grants, exchanging an asset for it. And finally, can come through an entity generating it in-house. So, the recognition criteria relates to the purchase of an intangible asset. And secondly, internally generated intangible asset. So, we first look at the purchase of an intangible asset. So, here we capitalize the asset at cost. Then we less any accumulated depreciation and impairment losses. Okay. So, when we say cost, it entails the purchase price of the intangible asset plus any directly attributable cost, such as legal fees, testing costs, etc. Now, amortization is to commence when the intangible asset is available for use. Move on to discuss the internally generated intangible asset. Now, here the cost of generating some intangible assets internally, such as brands, masthead, customer list, is often difficult to distinguish from the cost of maintaining or enhancing the entity's operation. Therefore, we cannot recognize such intangible items as an intangible asset. So we expense it in, what, in the profit or loss account. Now, other costs of generating internally generated intangible assets are classified based on whether they arise at the research phase or the development phase. So let's first look at the research phase. 
So a research is the original and planned investigation undertaken with the prospect of gaining new scientific or technical knowledge and understanding. For example, a pharmaceutical company seeking to undertake activities or tests aim at obtaining new knowledge to develop a new vaccine. Okay, so the company is researching the unknown and at this stage, no future economic benefit is expected to flow to the entity. Therefore, such costs are to be expensed through the profit or loss account. Okay, development on the other hand is the application of research findings or other knowledge to a planned or design for the production of new or substantially improved materials, devices, products, processes, systems, or services before the start of commercial production or usage. Okay, so after you have researched and found the knowledge, you move a step further into putting it into action to arrive at something that can generate you economic benefits. For instance, the pharmaceutical company that we spoke about earlier setting out to produce the new vaccine that it researched to acquire the knowledge. Now, an intangible asset arising from development must be capitalized if an entity can demonstrate all of the following criteria. 1. The technical feasibility of completing the intangible asset so that it will be available for use or sale. Second, the entity has the intention to complete the asset for either usage or selling it off. Thirdly, the entity has the ability to use or sell the asset. That is, the entity will have the financial, technical or manpower resource to use it. The fourth is existence of a market if it is to be sold or the usefulness of the asset if it is to be used internally. The next point is that availability of adequate technical, financial and other resources to complete the asset. Okay, you have all it takes to complete the assets. And the last is that the cost of the asset can be measured reliably. Let's move on to talk about the treatment of development costs. So once the development costs have been capitalized, the assets should be amortized over its finite life. So amortization must only begin when the commercial production has commenced, matching the income and expenditure to the period in which it relates. Each development project must be reviewed at the end of each accounting period to ensure that the recognition criteria are still met. Then lastly, if the criteria are no longer met, then the previously capitalized cost must be written off to the income statement immediately. Okay. So, Ian is involved in developing new products and has spent $15 million on acquiring the patent to aid in this development. The initial investigative phase of the project cost an additional $6 million whereby it was determined that the future feasibility of the product will be guaranteed. So subsequent expenditure incurred on the product was $8 million, of which $5 million was spent on functioning prototype and the remainder on getting the product into a safe and sellable condition. Now, a further $1 million was spent on marketing and $500,000 on training sales staff on how to demonstrate the use of the product. At the end of the reporting date, the product had not yet been completed. So explain how Ian should account for the expenditure in its financial statement. So let's look at the solution. Now, if you look at the first point, the purchase of the patent, because it was done for the purpose of development, it should be capitalized at $50 million and amortized over its useful life. Secondly, the $6 million spent on the investigative phase is essentially research and should be expensed through the profit or loss account. Okay, the $8 million subsequently spent after completion of the research phase is a development expenditure and is capitalized as an intangible non-current asset on the statement of financial position. Now, this is because $5 million was spent on functioning prototype, which is to further develop the asset into becoming fit to generate economic benefit to the entity. Now, the remainder was also into getting the product into a safe and sellable condition. It means that it has passed the criteria to make it fit to be used or sold. It is not to be amortized as the project is not yet complete. But here, an impairment review can be carried out to see if the asset has lost any value. The 1.5 million, that is 1 million spent on marketing and 500,000 on training sales staff should be expensed through the profit or loss account because it does not directly relate to the development of the assets. Now let's look at another illustration. So JSK is a large pharmaceutical business involved in the research and development of viable new drugs. So it commenced initial investigation into the viability of a new drug on 1st January 2015 at a cost of $50,000 per month. 
So on 1st July 2015, GSK were able to demonstrate commercial viability of the new drug and intend to sell it on the open market once fully completed. Costs subsequent to 1st July 2015 remain at $50,000 per month. At 31st December 2015, GSK is reporting date. The drug was not yet complete, but it is believed that by mid year 2016, the drug will be available for sale. That the finance director is confident of the success of the drug sale, that he wishes to revalue the intangible at the reporting date, using a discounted cash flow model to establish a fair value. Now we are to explain the treatment of the above cost in GSK's financial statement for the year ended 31st December 2015. Now for the cost in CAF within a period of 1st January to 1st July 2015, it will be considered as a research cost and expense to the profit or loss account. So that will be $300,000, which is the $50,000 each month from January to June. Then subsequently, from July to 31st December, it was clearly seen that they were at the development phase. They were embarking on an action, the further the research that was carried out to developing the product. So we capitalized this expenditure which will also give us $300,000 from July to December. Now here, we are not going to amortize the development cost or the assets because it has an infinite useful life. It will therefore be reviewed for impairment annually. Now the fair value of the assets, as the finance manager wanted to do, cannot be determined because there is no active market. Fellows, that is where we bring our discussion to an end. If you have any feedback, kindly drop them in the comment section below. Whilst you do that, we we'll crave your indulgence to subscribe by clicking on the, the red subscribe button below and click on the notification bell by it. Share to your friends and let them come on board. Let's learn accounting together. Thank you very much for your time.